Boker Tov. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the al Day. Glad you're here. The study of Parasha Shemot. Uh, the power of Hashem hears our cry, answers our prayer, and um, begins the redemption. Baruch Hashem. This is the beginning. This is the dawn of redemption, the dawn of salvation. Baruch Hashem. Our call is to have faith and to pray and to trust God and to continue to cry out to him. We know that he's answering. We know that he's helping us. I shared a great insight yesterday uh, that we, we discovered in our daily um, uh, daily morning devotional. I've shared it on Ask the Rabbi page. <clears throat> and it said that uh, the gist of the wonderful insight was that even while God is helping us and that while he's in the process of helping us, he helps us. That's how good Hashem is. And while he's in the process of helping us, he helps us. He continues to help us. So thank Hashem for his help. Thank Hashem for his mercy. And today, let's dive into the Aliyah, shall we? Uh, yesterday was powerful. It was the uh, the power shot of the burning bush. Moses is commissioned. Hashem reveals the essence of his name. Eye. Uh, and uh, I shall be that I shall be, right? It's aye, asher aye. And so we're going to continue on. We're in, on page 305, page 305, chapter 3. We're going to begin reading in verse uh, 16, of it, it is actually. <clears throat> it says, go and gather the elders of Israel and say to them, Adonai, the God of your forefathers, has appeared to me, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of Egypt, to the land of Canaan, the, the Amorite, the Pezerite, the Hivite, the Jezusite, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Hashem is going to bring us up out of the affliction. Say, Hashem is bringing me out of the affliction. They will heed your voice. You and the elders of Israel shall come to the king of Egypt. And say to him, Adonai, the God of the Hebrews, happened upon us. And now please let us go on a three-day journey in the wilderness. And we shall bring offerings to Adonai, our God. Isn't it interesting, by the way, that <clears throat> the Exodus, which I laid out yesterday, and hopefully you heard it, those of you who are faithful daily watchers, Listeners, participants, uh, heard the, the, the plan of salvation yesterday from the book of Exodus. We were in Egypt. We couldn't save ourselves. God saved us, saved by the blood of the Lamb, went to the Red Sea, which is a mikvah for immersion. From there, you know, and by the way, we're born again at that point. I left that, 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 um, that part out. See, the, 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 the concept of becoming born again, the concept of becoming a new creation, a newborn baby, a sinless newborn baby, those concepts, those exact phrases actually come from rabbinic, pharisaical Judaism. I know. You thought that they were invented by the Apostle Paul. And you're not alone. But in fact, he was only borrowing those phrases from the Pharisee school, the rabbinic Judaism of the oral law that he had been to, he had learned about all that when he was in Pharisee school. By the way, you do realize that baptism in a body of water is from the oral law, right? Like there's really nothing in the written Torah that tells us to get baptized in a mikvah, as it were, immersed, toveled in a uh, body of water, you realize that that comes from the whole Torah. So people that say that they don't believe in the law or the teachings of men, quote unquote, but they believe in water baptism is here. Um, what I was going to say is, isn't it interesting that you have all of that plan of salvation and then three days later, we're brought to the giving of the, of the Torah. 
thought that was interesting. Just the three whole three days always pops up. Uh, verse 19, I know that the king of Egypt will not allow you to go. Isn't that interesting? God is telling Moses to go tell the king of Egypt to let my people go. And yet he tells him, I know that he's not going to let you go, but I want you to go do it anyway. See, sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, we just got to we got to speak the word of God. We got to pray. We've got to prophesy. We got to speak to the winds and the winds aren't going to move. We're not going to see them comply, but we've got to speak to them because Hashem has a plan. And of course, we know that the king of Egypt ended up letting us go. Yes, he did. But at first he didn't. So just because we don't see the mountains move or the sea part doesn't mean we, we stop believing. I know that the king of Egypt will not allow you to go except through a strong hand. I will, I shall stretch out my hand and I shall strike Egypt with all my wonders that I shall perform in its midst. And after that, he will send you out. I shall grant this people favor in the eyes of Egypt so that it will happen that when you go, you will not go empty handed. Each woman shall request from her neighbor and the one who lives in our house, silver vessels, golden vessels, and garments. You know, I, I have to admit, that's the first time I've noticed that it's the women who ask. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But it's the first time I've, I've noticed that the women were the ones that were going about asking for uh, the jewelry. The silver vessels, golden vessels, probably maybe, maybe it's because it's just men are more pragmatic. Nothing against women, but men are probably thinking more about, hey, you know, I need to pack food and water, the remote control or tea set or silver, not tea set. I guess you wouldn't drink a silver tea set, a silver uh, serving set. <clears throat> so it says, and women said, amen. All right, so it says, and you shall put them on your sons and daughters, and you shall empty out Egypt. Chapter 4, capitulo 4, verso 1. <clears throat> Moses responded and said, but they will not believe me, and they will not heed my voice, for they will say, Hashem did not appear to you. Now, Moses here is, you know, this is the great and mighty Moses. Now, you have to know that Moses was brought up and he heard, like I said yesterday, his mother nursed him, right? So, you know, his mother had to have told Moses, Moses, let me explain to you about your miraculous birth. Let me explain to you how I put you in a, in a teva and sent you in the Nile, which, by the way, the Nile is a big river. It's dangerous. There's alligators in there. I mean, I, I took a lot. There's a lot of faith to put you in a basket and put you down the Nile. I don't know. I know there's alligators, crocodiles anyway, in the Nile. Are there also hippos? I'm assuming there are. I don't know. I'm not an ex expert. But hippos are actually more dangerous. You know, you might have been to the zoo and whatever. The hippo is like extremely dangerous. But anyway, the point being is that she... I put in there, and then you float it, and then uh, the daughter of of uh, of Pharaoh saw you. I didn't read the source, by the way. I think it's a Rebenu Bachia. I don't recall if it's in Rebenu Bachia where I read the source, but anyway, <clears throat> there's a miracle there. And um, let me see if this is it right quick. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, it's an, it's it's my monk. So first of all, the Talmud brings down that, and this is comes the, the this is in the this the source is not cited here, but I want to say it's in the tractate Megillah thirteen A, if I'm not mistaken. And it brings down that Pharaoh's daughter, and it brings down that Pharaoh's daughter was actually going to the Nile, going to the Nile in order to become a convert.
to the conclusion on her own that the conclusion on her own that the idolatry of her her father's house was nonsense and she was believing in the god of abraham isaac and jacob which in of itself ladies and gentlemen is a miracle and she was going to the Nile to immerse in the Nile for a mikvah because she felt like that's what the spirit of Hashem was telling her to do, which, by the way, is a miracle, which, by the way, I just got through saying that the immersion in a mikvah comes from the oral law. And if that's what God was calling her to do, say la. So it says here in the comments, Vetered bat Pharaoh. Pharaoh's daughter went down. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai says beyond the simple meaning of this verse to say that when she went down, she went down to cleanse herself of the idolatry of her father's house. Compare this to Isaiah 440. Rashi provides a similar interpretation. She went into the waters of the Nile to become a convert to Judaism. Mahal Prague. We just celebrated yesterday the Purim of the Curtains. And it was the Maharal of Prague that appeared to both the falsely accused Jew and the liar who falsely accused him. It was the Maharal of Prague that appeared in the dream, one to comfort the Jew and the other to tell the liar, you better tell the truth in court tomorrow or you're going to die. But anyway, the Maharal explains the motivation behind these behind these interpretations it says the daughter of pharaoh must have been a most deserving person to have been chosen as the instrument instrument by which the life of moses was saved understand this the redeemer was saved from the nile by a woman who had just become a convert to judaism therefore this is so good this is why converts are so important what this means is that and as extensive, uh, ostensibly, the Redeemer of Israel was introduced to Israel by a convert to Israel. Isn't that interesting? We might ask ourselves the question, why do, is Hashem now raising up Hashem? Why is Hashem now encouraging all these people to convert to Judaism in Yeshua, Judaism without Yeshua, that's not the, that's not the way. In, in Yeshua, why is he doing it now? And the answer is because that's how it was done in the original pattern. A convert to Judaism introduced the Redeemer to the people that she had joined. So as it turns out, Moses not only was nursed by his mother. You understand he was... He, so. <clears throat> There's an insight, by the way, too. There's, a, there's a, an insight to this that says that the mother tried to use the, the royal nurses because, you know, that's protocol. But Moses would not accept their milk because it wasn't kosher. So he would only accept his milk, the milk from a Jewish, the Jewess. But also understand that since, since the daughter of Pharaoh was a convert herself, that Moses inst actually grew up in a kosher home. That was the plan of God. So just like it says in the Gospels that Hashem chose Miriam because she was a God-fearing, she was a Torah-observant, godly Jewess, He chose her to be the mother of the Redeemer in the same way Hashem chose the daughter of Pharaoh, who incidentally, according to the Talmud, her name was Batya, which means daughter of God. Now it goes on to say. Now I, I was I started this whole thing by saying that you got to know that Moses was told by his mother these miracles. Well, one of the miracles. So, so first of all, you have a miracle there that just so happened that your basket could have floated anywhere. You understand the basket could have floated into the Mediterranean Ocean, Mediterranean Sea. It could have been eaten by an alligator or crocodile. It could have been destroyed by a hippo. It could have been found by anybody. It could have been found by palace guards. But it floated to Batya, who just happened to be emerging in the Nile, to convert to Judaism. Batya's reward was, since you left your father's house, this is why rabbis and sages have so much higher than born Jews. In Messianic Jews, 
in Messianic Judaism today, it's the other way around. Messianic Judaism today, if you're in the Messianic Jewish world, you've been taught the highest level is to be a born Jew. And if you're not a born Jew, well, you're in the kingdom, but you're a Gentile and you're, you're not really a second class citizen. We're not going to actually say that. We're just going to say that you're like, uh, well, you know, not as special, but still loved and still appreciated. How many know that's true? If you know that's true, type amen. However, in Judaism, it's the reverse. The highest level is to be a convert. Why? Because a born Jew, pfft, okay, so you were born into it. Mazel tov. You grew up with a kosher spoon in your mouth. All you knew is kosher. All you knew is the holidays. All you knew is this. All you knew is that. It's wonderful. It's second nature. Lighting the candles is second nature. But if you're a convert, you grew up in depravity. You grew up in idolatry. You had, and, and you grew up surrounded by family who were all in that stuff. And you had to make a conscious decision to leave all of that and come into, into the house of Israel. Now, how many of you people that have done that know how hard it is around the holidays? Awkward, isn't it? It's not awkward for a born Jew. It's not awkward for a born Jew at all. The born Jew doesn't have to face his family and say, you know, I've, yeah, I've decided not to keep Christmas. It's not awkward for him at all, but you, you're, you as the convert are probably the only person in your entire family amongst brothers and sisters, cousins, uncles, second cousins twice removed that keep the Pesach. And that's why the sages say you're awesome. You're more, and that's why the sages say, by the way, you're more awesome than me. That's why the sages say, I can't stand where you stand. I don't know what it's like. I don't know what it's like. There was, a, there was an insight one time where a sage said, I wish, I wish I could know what it was like to purposely turn away from non-kosher food, which is a big deal. But there's another miracle. So in addition to all of that, it says here, and she sent her maidservant. The word... It says here, the word, this phrase, this is to, so at, whereas it says she sent her maidservant, that she's reaching for the basket. This is Rashi comment to Sota 11a. This word is also related to ama, a cubit, teaching that although the basket containing Moses was actually beyond her reach, a miracle happened and her arm grew several cubits longer until she was able to grasp the basket. Now, how many of you know the, uh, the comic book character, the Fantastic Four, uh, Mr. Fantastic? He can stretch his limbs and everything. You can see that's in the Talmud. But anyway, so she there was a miracle. She was able to reach the basket was beyond her reach. So Moses grows up and he knows all of this. He he understands all of this these miracles associated with his life. And now I I I went through all of that so that you could come back to chapter 4 and see Moses's humanity and be encouraged. How many of you, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm going to raise my hand ahead of time because I already know the question I'm about to ask, obviously. I'm going to raise my hand. How many of you have seen Hashem do incredible miracles in your life, have, have, have witnessed Hashem rescue you from um, seemingly impossible situations and circumstances, and yet when you're confronted with another challenge, you doubt. Anybody out there? I know I have. Now, we're not supposed to doubt. We're supposed to trust. So, so that's all part of our training, okay? We're supposed to trust. And we have to remind ourselves, and we have to remind each other to trust and not doubt. And it's a human condition to do that. Now, none of you, none of you, I, 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 
contrary to popular belief, I, contrary to popular belief, when I was born, there was my mom did not fill with light. <laughs> I was not born circumcised. I was not put in a basket. I did not have all this miraculous. My mother did not reach out her hand and it, it expand to grab me or whatever. And that, that didn't happen to me and it didn't happen to you. But it did happen to Moses. So you would think that anybody who grew up, and by the way, you know, grow up into the palace, anybody that should have faith and trust should be Moses. How many of us have taught God at the burning bush? How many of us stood before a literal burning bush with the literal Mashiach in the middle of it on the mountain, on the mountain of Hashem talking to him face to face? How many of us have done that? Uh, nobody. Nobody has. If you say you have, you probably need to see uh, a professional to help you walk through some things. Chapter 4, verse 1, but that's exactly what happened to Moses, and listen to his doubt. Now, this is not good. Again, we need to have faith, and we need to encourage them, but I want to encourage you not to be so down on yourself. Because Moses doubts God. Moses responded to Hashem and said, but they will not believe me. He, bam, right off the bat, Moses is, like Rebbe Seen likes to say, he's skeet shooting. You ever been with somebody and you're trying to have a biblical discussion with them? They throw up an objection. You get a rock solid answer, and they shoot that. If you're in a conversation with somebody that they give you an objection, you give them an awesome answer, and they don't sit back and contemplate and go, "Hmm, that's very interesting. Let me think about that." But they immediately give you the next objection out of the conversation, or change the subject, buy them a lemonade, and talk about the ball game because you're wasting your time. Those people are not interested in learning. But I digress. Moses responded and will not believe me and they will not heed my voice for they will say, Hashem said to you. Hashem said to him, what is that? He said, cast it. He said, cast it on the ground. Okay, cast it on the ground. By, by the way, the Hebrew, I just, I just glanced over at the Hebrew because I, I was interested. It, it translates a staff. But in the Hebrew, it says, Adonai mazei beyadecha. What is that in your hand? And it says, Vayomer mate. It says, it says he, now, it's, it's appropriate to say a staff. But it's just interesting because it says, Vayomer mate. Because this is a particular staff. But anyway, see, he says in verse three, he said, cast it on the ground and he cast it on the ground and it became a snake. Moses fled from it. Hashem said to him, stretch out your hand and grasp its tail. He stretched out his hand and grasped it tightly, which, by the way, for me, that would have been that would have taken a great amount of faith. And it became a staff in his palm so that he shall believe so that they shall believe that Adonai the God of our forefathers appeared to you, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Adonai said further to him, bring your hand to your bosom. And he brought his hand to his bosom and he withdrew it. And behold, it had, it had uh, excuse me, his hand was leprous like snow. He said, return your hand to the bosom. He returned his hand to the bosom. Then he removed it from the bosom. And behold, it reverted to be like flesh. It shall be that if they do not believe you and do not heed the voice of the first sign, they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall be that I do not believe even these two signs who do not heed your voice. Then you shall take from the water of the river and pour it out on the dry land. And the water that you shall take from the river will become blood when it is on the dry land. Now, this is to teach us, by the way, that, that um, miraculous signs are supposed to be a, a uh, indication of a true prophet. But there's a caveat, and this is what most believers need to understand from the Jewish point of view. There's a caveat to that. If some, and this comes from Deuteronomy chapter 13. If somebody comes and does great miraculous signs, raises the dead, heals the sick, opens blind eyes, etc., 
that's all great and wonderful. But what if that person, that prophet says, okay, look, you see what I did over here? I raised the dead. That was awesome. See what I did over here? I walked on water. That's great. See what I did over here? I, uh, you know, healed somebody that was uh, lame. That's fantastic. Now, here's my message to you. My message is break the law of Moses. According to Deuteronomy 13, God has told us in advance 3,000 some odd years ago. That's my test to you to see if you'll follow that false prophet or not. So when you say to a Jewish person, but look, Yeshua healed the sick and he walked on water. So eat a ham sandwich. It's okay. To a Jew, what you've just said is textbook, classic example of a biblically certified false prophet. Case closed. I don't need to hear anything else. As a Jew, because I believe in the Bible, and that's my standard, when you tell me that the Messiah did miracles and then told me to walk away from Torah, you just told me he's a false Messiah, Hasve Shalom. I don't need to hear anything else. However, when you tell me that the Messiah did miracles and he leads us into a Torah true life, well, now I'm all ears. Qualifies just one commandment of the Torah. Just one. He nullifies just one commandment. Even if he nullifies just one commandment of the Torah, such as circumcision, for instance, you say, well, everything else applies, but you don't have to be circumcised. He's a false prophet. Why? Because circumcision is also a mitzvah. Because there's people that believe that. There's people that believe that, well, I believe in eating kosher. I believe in keeping the holidays. I believe in. Um, all this other stuff, but I don't think you need to be circumcised today. You've just nullified the Torah because you can't take one commandment out of it. No one has that prerogative, not even Messiah. You do realize that, right? You realize that the, even the Do you know why? Because he is the Torah. So it says, Moses replied to Hashem, please, my Lord, I am not a man of words. Look at the lack of faith that Moses has. It says, please, my Lord, I am not, I am, I am not a man of words, not since yesterday, nor since the day before yesterday, nor since you first spoke to your servant, for I am head of mouth and head of speech. Then Hashem said to him, who makes a mouth for man? Who makes one dumb or deaf or sighted or blind? It is not, is it not I, Hashem? So go now. I shall be with your mouth and teach you what you should say. He replied, please, my Lord, sin through whomever you will send. The wrath of Hashem burned against Moses and he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he will surely speak. Moreover, behold, he is going out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will, re he will rejoice in his heart. Now, incidentally, um, isn't it interesting that we were slaves in Egypt, and yet it says that Aaron is going to come out to meet you? Do you know why? The sages bring down that in Egypt, there were not any bars or chains or fences that kept us in. That ultimately we were slaves in Egypt because of two things. A, because of our fear. And B, because we became captivated by the culture. In other words, we had enslaved ourselves. There weren't even any fences. There weren't any gates. They, they didn't even have any guards. This is why Aaron could leave and go meet Moses. Verse 15, you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I shall be in your mouth and with his mouth and teach you both uh, uh, what you are to do. He shall speak for you to the peoples and it shall be with uh, and it will be that he will be your mouth and you will be his leader. And this staff you shall take in your hand with which you shall perform the signs. End of our Aliyah today. End of our Aliyah today. Thank you so much for being a part of the Aliyah. It is a blessing to be with you. Um, and uh, let me just uh, get rid of some...
people here. There we go. Thank you so much for being a part of me. We look forward to being part of this together tomorrow for the sixth and seventh reading. I look forward to being with you. Until then, have a blessed, wonderful, and amazing day. May Hashem grant you shalom. May all slanderers and liars uh, be exposed, just like they were exposed in Egypt. And may God deliver us and do miracles. Thank you so much. By the way, with your help, we are able to continue the Aliyah Day and to bring it to people all across the world. So may uh, you continue to help us. Thank you so much for your support. Many people have given, and it's such a blessing. Look forward to being with all of you. Have a great and wonderful day. Shalom Aleichem. <laughs>